Good morning and welcome to the Deanery Garden at Canterbury Cathedral on this Saturday the 5th of December as we meet for our morning prayers early in the morning. It's uh, a clear day today, no wind and it's Saturday morning and so we've come to be with the animals at breakfast time and we're using as our tree, the, really the largest tree within this area it's not strictly speaking indigenous, but it's been here a very long time. I'm meaning the great bay tree behind me. We've mulberries here, we've apple trees, uh, but here's the bay tree and the wisteria is here, still covered in leaf. None of these indigenous, but many of them here for a long time. But it's the bay tree, which we are actually going to concentrate on in our tree reflection. But also this morning, uh, let's feed the animals their breakfast first and then we'll talk about our reflection and all that we're going to do. But here's a, a Saturday morning treat for them. And you'll hear the noise of our duck at the moment. But I'm going to feed Winston and the boys first. And they're this side, they're already out because they sleep in the little log house here. So Winston, boys, here you are. Hey. Here we are, Winston. And then we'll let the little girls out as well. Come on. Hey, come on. Hey, girls. Let's put this down here for them. All around, and then they've got plenty of room. There we go. Put this here. Okay, there we are, Clemmy. It's wonderful how silence falls, and I'll just shut the gate here. There we are. And we're set for our own thoughts and reflections in this Saturday context. So that noise is the chickens realising that there's food around. It's a day of many, many anniversaries this December the 5th. Some days are, are like that and I'm, I'm going just to detail a few. Um, so Let's see that in, in 1952, the great smog in London, which in the end was, was ended by the Clean Air Act gradually through the 1950s, but in 1952, 4,000 people lost their lives through breathing difficulties in London in the great smog. It's hard to remember those days when you actually couldn't see a few yards in front of you because the, the, the smog was so dense and this happened at autumn times. 1958 saw two step forwards which seem rather old-fashioned now. Uh, the subscriber trunk dialing on telephones was first begun. The Queen made a telephone call to the Lord Provost of Edinburgh from Bristol and that seems such a, a, a long time ago in terms of technology. But at the same time, in 1958, the Preston Bypass was opened on this day and that was the first motorway in England. And now we just take them for granted. There's a whole list of, 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 of people. Um, Christina Rossetti was born on this day in 1830. Walt Disney was born on this day in 1901. Mozart died on this day in 1791. Alexander Dumas died on this day in 1870. Claude Monet died in 1926. In 2012, the great Australian philanthropist Dame Elizabeth Murdoch died and in 2013 Nelson Mandela died and we remembered yesterday in 1976 that Benjamin Britten died, the great composer. Now I'm going to just do a little bit on all of those, not separately, in the reflection. That's why I'm going so fast over them today. Just a, a word about a place dear to our hearts, the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg uh, in Virginia and there there is a Canterbury chaplain and uh, in 1776, 
Phi Beta Kappa, the oldest academic honor society in the United States, held its first meeting in the College of William and Mary. So we pray for the College of William and Mary today and give thanks for our links with it from Canterbury. So let's begin our prayers on this particular day, which is important for another reason, as you'll see when we come to read our lesson. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Reveal among us the light of your presence, that we may behold your power and glory. Blessed are you, sovereign God of all. To you be praise and glory forever. In your tender compassion, the dawn from on high is breaking upon us to dispel the lingering shadows of night. As we look for your coming among us this day, open our eyes to behold your presence and strengthen our hands to do your will, that the world may rejoice and give you praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind, and as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Our psalm on this fifth morning of the month is Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's, and all that fills it, the compass of the world and all who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and set it firm upon the rivers of the deep. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Or who can rise up in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lifted up their soul to an idol, nor sworn an oath to a lie. They shall receive a blessing from the Lord a just reward from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord who is mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. So we come to our reading, which is from the book of the Revelation to John, and we're in the very last chapter. And I'm beginning to read at verse 6. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And the angel said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, let the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. 
outside are the dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David. I am the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to that one the plagues described in this book. But if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away their share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. The one who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Well, that's the end of quite a little pilgrimage. The whole of the month of November, for we began on Monday, November the 2nd, with the book of the Revelation, and have come through now to Saturday, December the 5th. And we've been brave, and I thank you for it, in doing what I said yesterday, and staying absolutely with the readings given to us in our lectionary, except when a special day or saint's day took their place, or a Sunday interrupted. And that is important in the way we worship. And again, as I said yesterday, it's tempting always to choose passages which are favourites of ours, passages which are joyful and happy. But like the Psalms, the book has taken us through terrifying scenes and scenes of suffering and tragedy, as well as scenes of the greatest glory attempting to be described in words in the whole of the New Testament and has brought us through to visions of that which is beyond, which words cannot really describe. But here in the end, the whole thing becomes rather moving. For John is left with the angel. And the angel again gives him the warning that the angels are only fellow servants of God with us, with your brothers and sisters, he says, the prophets, to whom God sends his spirit. And that's an important lesson all the way through this book, for the message always from John is the only worship that can take place is from the whole of creation to the Creator. But the other message is that the Creator has taken human form in Jesus, who has given so many different names, a whole kaleidoscope of names used for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but today names like the Bright Morning Star, all taken from the Old Testament prophets and books, and John reinterprets them for us as we go through. We've come to an end. But as T.S. Eliot, whom we quoted in Little Gidding yesterday, says, that which we call an end is very often a beginning. And if we think we have even begun to scratch the surface of the images given to us in this strange and rather wonderful book, then we are mistaken. We shall go back to it individually, and as the lectionary brings it to us, time and time again, and different phrases will give us courage. But there is a marvellous point at the end when 
The church's voice is heard in the Spirit. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. It's a liturgical moment. It's a moment of Eucharist. It's a moment when those little communities in exile and facing such terrible persecution are breaking bread together and saying to the Lord, as we do at every Eucharist, come, Lord Jesus. And the answer is given in the past, in the cross, in Calvary of the giving up of that life, and in the birth of the Messiah, which we're about to celebrate at Christmas time. It's given in the future with visions of knowing that fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Earthly powers have their time and pass on. And it's given in the present when anyone in trial becomes what is so important to John from the very beginning and we almost are going back to the beginning with some of these sentences. A conqueror one who overcomes and when that overcoming takes place that overcoming even to death takes place then Jesus comes and is there with them at their particular Calvary. John is clear that a time of great crisis is about to happen and is already happening, he himself in exile. But what is clear also is that he believes that those who have heard in the Spirit the songs of the eternal Zion of the heavenly Jerusalem will, in the Roman courtroom, at the Roman scaffold, in the Roman arena, hear also the voice calling out from the vision of heaven, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. On this day, and I didn't mention this is one of the dates, in 1931, the huge cathedral church of Christ the Saviour in Moscow was destroyed by the order of Stalin. It stood not far from the Kremlin. It was big enough to hold 10,000 people. There in 1882, Tchaikovsky's 1812 overture was performed for the very first time on the eve of the coronation of Alexander III. And in 1931, this sign of Christian worship of the Orthodox Church was blown up with dynamite and became a field of rubble so great that it took a year to clear. The pictures of that day are devastating and they are of course in black and white as the towers of this great place of worship collapsed with an explosion ordered by the state for they were intending to build the palace of the Soviets right across it. In fact that building was interrupted by the war but afterwards the place lying derelict eventually became a public swimming pool and bits and pieces of it were taken away to use in all kinds of, of, of uh, stations and undergrounds and, and buildings and what it must have meant to faithful Christians at that time in Moscow and throughout Russia is uncountable. Well, in 2000 at the Feast of the Transfiguration the new Cathedral Church of Christ the Saviour in Moscow was dedicated and so many had given of their wealth to recreate that which had been destroyed for here was a time when worship could begin in that holy place again and the first act was the church's desire to canonize the murdered imperial family. But all of that happened as one generation passed and another came into being. But that worship of 10,000 in a huge place is just the same as the worship of maybe two or three 
persecuted Christians that John is thinking about at the end of his revelation, who in the breaking of bread are just as clearly as St. Stephen, seeing a vision of the great heavens opened and the Lamb of God reaching out and coming to Stephen's own Calvary, which will be replicated by thousands and thousands of faithful people through the years that followed, until now and on into the future. A wonderful book, a puzzling book, a difficult book, but we've made the journey and we've seen a whole kaleidoscope of different colours with the light of Christ shining through them, but some looking rather opaque at times to us and then in a different configuration being the very sentence we want. I named this morning Christina Rossetti, Walt Disney, Mozart, Alexander Dumas, Claude Monet, Elizabeth Murdoch, Nelson Mandela, Benjamin Britten, all in different ways, painting a great picture of creativity. I so much remember the enjoyment that the performance in a church of Noah's Flood, which Britain composed to be done just like that, and all the creatures, or the performance of the magic flute by Mozart in the garden here, with choristers playing the creatures in the magic flute, which come forward around uh, the Tamino, and uh, all of that happening. Actions of creativity, Claude Monet's pictures, all of God's fine creation and the beautiful garden at Givenet, Nelson Mandela's courage and faithfulness all the way through in his desire to create a new and reconciled South Africa. And Christina Rossetti painting pictures of faithfulness in small cameos, one of which we shall use with great joy at Christmas in the bleak midwinter. Frosty wind made moan. Earth stood hard as iron, water like a stone. Snow had fallen, snow on snow, snow on snow, in the bleak midwinter long ago. A verbal picture as great as any great oil painting. But we use the gifts we have. Tomorrow, on the 6th of December, all the boys next door in Linaka House, who live here beside me, are doing a sponsored row from six in the morning till six in the evening in shifts in their bubbles, as we call it during this pandemic, for a local charity. I'll say more about it tomorrow, but each one doing what they can for one another during this time of crisis. And the revelation is all about a time of crisis and the capacity of humanity when doing things together and with the vision of the Creator working also with the creation in their hearts, minds and imaginations what can be achieved. So we give thanks as we sit under the bay tree, the bay tree which was and is the sign of conquering. Bay wreaths were given to those who'd conquered in a multitude of different ways in Greek society, in Roman society, and still now. The bay wreath in racing, as it's given, Formula One, um, is still used. And of course we use the bay leaves here to flavour all kinds of food. We give thanks for it, but we give thanks for it mostly on this day as we finish the book of Revelation as a sign of triumph, the ability to overcome and to have a vision that in the end that which is in the heavenly vision will overcome all that is finite and passing in Earth's life. For the moment though, humanity suffers and individuals suffer many crises and as we pray for them in their different ways, you will bring your own prayers this morning to our words of prayer on this Saturday, the 5th of December. We're praying in the Anglican Communion today for Gasabo in Rwanda, the diocese there, 
and for Laurent Mbanda, the primate, and the Diocese of Edinburgh in Scotland, and John Armis, the bishop there, and all the people of that diocese. And here, in the Diocese of Canterbury, as we pray for Justin, our Archbishop, for Rose, Bishop of Dover, for Tim, Bishop at Lambeth, we are praying for the living of Advent well, and praying for John Marlow, the Diocesan Director of Ordinance. So let's pray our own prayers, but bind them together in the Advent Collect. Bring your own concerns together to a time of prayer. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armour of light, now, in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the quick and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and ever. Amen. So we pray each in our own language the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Moment of silence now for your own prayers. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path, and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love, and those whom you would pray for, today and always. Amen. Hello, Clemmy. Have you finished your breakfast? Eh? Okay. We're all quite quiet this morning. It's amazing how breakfast makes people rather quiet as they're enjoying it and digesting it. How are you? <laughs> Disturbing your breakfast, aren't I? Hey? <laughs>